Welcome, everyone. This is our seventh uh, Turfy Lecture. Uh, these lectures are made possible by a generous donation from Al Turfy. So he's sitting right over there. So let's, let's give him a hand. So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Oscar Fernandez from Wellesley College. Professor Fernandez obtained his undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago in 2004 and his PhD in 2009 from UM Ann Arbor. His thesis, The Hamiltonization of Non-Holonomic Systems and Applications, was completed under the direction of Anthony Block. After completion, he spent an additional year at UM as a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow and a year at the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications in Minnesota before accepting his position at Wellesley. He was promoted to associate professor in 2017 and is currently the factory, faculty director of the Forsheimer Learning and Teaching Center. Apart from his research interests uh, in dynamics and dynamical systems, Professor Fernandez has shown a strong commitment not merely to mathematics education but to diversity in education. He has been part of the Wellesley Emerging Scholars Initiative since 2012, written a book chapter on using constructivism to boost success in STEM fields for women and students of color and taught pre-calculus and introductory calculus to 25 first-generation students of color from the greater Boston area uh, at the Noonan Scholars Summer Academy in Boston. Outside of academic publishing, Professor Fernandez has written two popular books on mathematics, the first entitled Everyday Calculus, Discovering the Hidden Math Around You, and the second, which he will tell us a bit about today, The Calculus of Happiness, How a Mathematical Approach to Life Adds Up to Health, Wealth, and Love, I haven't asked him, but I don't know whether there are any guarantees on this. Um, so without further ado, our Turfy Lecture for 2018-19, Professor Oscar Fernandez. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> if you can hear, I have a little bit of a cold. I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old. so. They keep me on my toes and keep me using my cough medicine. Um, anyway, thank you for being here. So the talk I want to give you today is about the mathematics of happiness. Um, first thing I'll mention is that I've tried to keep the level as accessible as possible. So I'll be asking you questions. So hopefully, if you know the answers, or if even you don't, if you have some clue, just speak up. So I'd like this to be very much an interactive um, type of lecture for you. So. <clears throat> This talk is based on the book that I wrote last year, um, The Calculus of Happiness. There's a lot more in the book than I'll be sharing with you, but I've kind of cherry-picked a few examples and what I think are interesting and fun applications of pre-calculus level content. So here's a little brief outline of what I'll be sharing. Um, first thing I want to do is discuss a few insights from each category that the book touches on. So health, wealth, and love are certainly the main um, components. Um, so the first thing that we will talk about is metabolism and nutrition math. Uh, and how many of you know about this? Kinesiology maybe? Or? Okay, great. So this will be new to most of you, so you'll, you'll learn some good stuff um, from this part. Personal finance math, we'll talk about some of this, which again might seem kind of boring, but I'll make it nice and interesting for you. Uh, and then the mathematics of love, which is probably, if you were to pick one, maybe what you're here for, right? Okay, so first thing I want to tell you about is resting metabolic rate and TDEE. Um, so what is RMR? So here's a very simple definition. The daily energy and calories that your body burns in an awake and non-fasting at rest state. So they have labs, right? So you might show up in a lab after having eaten breakfast, maybe three, three hours afterwards. So it's kind of digested. And they might hook you up to a machine and measure your oxygen flow. And from that, determine how many calories your body's burning to do the basic things that it does, right? Grow your hair, um, pump your blood. Um, so this is kind of a baseline metabolic rate, a resting metabolic rate, daily energy needed to complete normal tasks for your body. So the first insight is that we actually burn our, our RMR and calories every day. So you don't have to do anything, right? By definition, this is an at rest, at rest but awake state, right? So as soon as you even lift a finger, and you get up out of bed, you're burning more calories than your RMR. So that's nice, right? So how many calories are we talking, right? You might think maybe 100, 200, but it's actually quite a lot. Um, so the first thing I want to mention is that there are lots of formulas that you can use to estimate RMR. 
So here are the most accurate. So there was actually a study done to see which one of these is most accurate. So the mifflin saint jour equations are the most accurate ones. So the top one over here is um, for men. The bottom one over here is for women. And these are all sort of multivariate regression type formulas, meaning they get a bunch of people in a room and they hook them up to these calorimetry machines and they measure oxygen flow and they try to estimate how many calories their body's burning and correlate that to how much they weigh, how old they are, how tall they are, whether they're male, female, <coughs> and other factors. So uh, all the groups used in the mifflin Jour equation were at least 19 years old, so that, that hopefully encompasses many of you. Um, so what I want to do is give you some mathematical insights, right? These are equations. So here's a question. Can anyone tell me the relationship between these two equations? Any brave souls out there? Yes. They differ by a constant. They differ by a constant, exactly. So everything else is exactly the same, right? The 4.5 W, the 15.9 H, everything else, but there's this plus 5, minus 161. So indeed, right, the RMR for men is RMR for women plus 166. Can anyone interpret this for me? OK, I heard men need more calories. OK, let's fine tune that. Anyone want to add some more to that? Yeah. OK, so the answer is males have a larger heart. They pump more blood, use more calories than women. Right? So not only do the RMR equations predict how much of a resting metabolic rate you have and that it's 166 calories greater for men and women of the same age and height. But again, you might wonder why this is true. So can anyone give me a third explanation for, for this? <laughs> so generally, one good explanation is body fat, right? So the average body fat percentage for a man, somewhere in the 20s, maybe in the teens if you're really fit. The average body fat percentage for a woman in the higher 20s, maybe lower 30s, right? And then pregnancy, of course, will, will shoot that number up. And the more uh, fat that you carry around in your body, the lower your rate of metabolic burn. So generally, a man carries around a smaller percentage of fat and therefore has more muscle to burn more calories, even though you have the same weight, height, and age, right? So that, that's, a, that's an interesting insight that comes from looking at these two equations. So the next thing I want to do is give you a different sort of insight, something that you probably already know, but you're seeing it in a different um, context. So here's a thought experiment. Let's set H equal to 66 and A equal to 34. So let's look at somebody who is 5 feet tall, 6 inches, and 34 years old. And I'll just look at the male um, equation. So we get this sort of equation, right? So what does this look like to you? What type of function? Looks like a line, right? And what could you say about that 4.5? It's the slope. And how about the 884? The y-intercept. You know these things, right? Isn't that cool? So this is a linear function with slope 4.5. As a linear function, <clears throat> we could interpret the slope as we normally do. If the w variable goes up by 1, then the y, the output, the RMR value, goes up by 4.5. So the mifflin saint jour equations predict that if you gain one pound, your RMR should go up by about 4.5 calories. And then if you go back to the sort of multilinear version of this, you can see the 15.9 number has the same interpretation. If I put in the weights and I put in the age, I would be left with a function of h. Its coefficient, 15.9, would be the slope. So it tells us that if you grow an inch taller, your RMR goes up by 15.9 calories. So can someone relate that if you have any little sisters or little brothers, right? Can you tell me a little story about why that number makes sense? The 15.9 calories number. Well, you might have noticed like, you know, little ones will just eat, 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 right? Especially if you're still growing, right? And once you get into high school, it's even worse and you start doing sports, possibly you start eating more and more and more. And it's kind of one of these things that you might not ever have thought about in terms of where it comes from, but this is, again, giving us some more insight. <clears throat> For every inch taller you grow, your RMR goes up by 15.9 calories. Notice that that's 
more than triple what happens, right, if you gain a pound. So there's a really big effect of growing an inch taller. You can imagine that in terms of a delivery mechanism to get nutrients to your taller body it takes much more energy if your arms are longer, if your head is higher off the ground, right? So that's kind of reflected in this number. And then this last one, if you age one year, calories go down by five, right? Anyone have any grandpas or grandmas? And notice how much food they eat now versus how much food they used to eat maybe 15, 20 years ago. So again, these are all insights that come from the RMR equations, but you have to know the slopes and the interpretations, right, to be able to extract them. Okay, so I've created a little calculator that you can go online. Uh, here's the website, and by the way, this talk, at the end, I'll give you a website that you, can, uh, that you can download the entire talk, so don't worry about taking notes. Anyway, you can go on here, you can calculate your own RMR. So I'll, I'll save the trouble for you of plugging in all the weight and height and all that stuff. Um, okay, so to wrap up this little section, total daily energy expenditure, what is that? Well, if RMR is the amount of calories you burn when you're awake, but basically couch potato states, <coughs> then TDEE is everything else you do. Maybe you go for a walk, maybe you go to the gym, maybe you go for a run, right? Maybe you just study, right? All of that burns calories. So TDEE would add on all of that um, cal caloric burn. And there's a simple calculator for estimating that also that you can go through. Okay, so I wanna tell you one last little bit about nutrition and math before moving on to the, the finance part. Um, so there's certainly a theory out there that if you eat more than your total daily energy expenditure, you will gain weight. The reality is that it depends on what you eat. So this is a very interesting twist to the story you might not be aware of. So next insight is that a calorie is not a calorie, but I'm sure you could find so many people that would completely disagree with me because it's a big debate, right, in the field of nutrition science. Uh, but here is my argument, right? Some macronutrients require more energy to digest and absorb. This is called diet-induced thermogenesis. Anybody know about this? Good, we're learning stuff, awesome. Okay, so here is a nice little table, and what does it say? It says if you take a macronutrient like protein, when you eat protein, a certain percentage of it, your body uses to help digest the protein, which seems kind of weird, right? But I like to use the following analogy. Think about a Starbucks, and it's like five in the morning and the employees are like showing up, or maybe it's three in the morning, I don't know, whenever they open, right before they open. Right? A shipment of stuff comes in, mugs and coffee and what have you. Before they can sell that stuff, energy has to be expended to transport it, to unpack it, to put it on the shelves, and then they sell the stuff. So even though they might sell a coffee for, I don't know, five dollars, it actually took some, some dollars to, to pay the employees to get that coffee sold. So really, the, the company did not net $5 from selling that coffee. You have to subtract the energy, the, the money it took right, to, to get the coffee to the customer. This is pretty much what happens in your body. So if you eat protein, about 20% to 35% of the calories you eat goes to this digestion absorption loss, if you will. So the energy yield of 100 calories is not 100 calories. It's about 65 to 80. You can see carbohydrates and fats have a different thermogenic effect, right? So if you're looking at this table, what's the takeaway? Eat more protein, <laughs> right? Right, so again, this might make sense with some of the advice you might have heard. My brother was a bodybuilder for a long time and he used to have all sorts of crazy regimens. He would wake up at five and he'd throw seven eggs in a blender and just drink it, you know? And I was like, you're crazy, but you know, now it sort of makes sense decades later, right? All right, so <clears throat> to finish up this little bit, I'll give you sort of the rest of the story uh, in, in summary format. So it turns out that, and there's research on all of this, right? If you eat more fiber and you swap your non-fiber carbs for poly and monounsaturated fats, very specific, and you limit your carbs to a certain amount, 150 grams per day, research shows that this does all this fabulous stuff which is kind of crazy, because it's just a change in your diet. This says nothing about exercise. So you may hear your doctor say that health is like 80% nutrition and 20% exercise, right? Anyway, this is a, this is a really cool result of um, nutrition science research. 
Okay, so let me tell you, tell you about inflation uh, and talk about cheeseburgers, all right? Um, so anybody know about the Federal Reserve? Any economists, econ majors in the room, business majors? Okay. So this is the nation's central bank. So here's a quote from their website. Inflation is a general increase in the overall price level of the goods and services in the economy. So price of a McDonald's cheeseburger in 1955. Any guesses? I hear 10 cents. Anything else? All right, we have some experience. <laughs> In New York City, okay, there's cost of living increase, right? All right, so 19 cents, right? So if you look back in time, this is how much it costs. Right, and today I, I double checked. You can get a $1 cheeseburger, it's on their value menu. Um, so the question is how much of a price increase is this? Well, what do we do? First of all, you gotta realize it's the same cheeseburger. So that's kind of, you know, disheartening because it's 26% more expensive. Right? It's the same cheeseburger, same buns and the cheese and the. Okay, so equates to about a 2.7% yearly increase in price. All right, so how did I get this number? Well, I said, let me take 19 cents and let me find a value such that every year when I multiply it by one plus X, one plus X, one plus X, for 63 years, it ends up being 100 cents, which is $1. So I just solve this equation, right? You probably have done this before in a different context. Just divide the 19, take the 63rd root and subtract the one and I've given you the percentage version. So that's where I get the 2.7 from. All right, so going back to the Federal Reserve, so they think that a 2% yearly inflation rate is most consistent over the long run with one of their mandates, which is to keep prices stable. So I look at this number 2% and I look at that number 2.7 and I say, man, maybe McDonald's is like, got a foothold on the general economy, which sort of makes sense, right? So. Insight number seven, right? There is a powerful entity, the Fed, who actively seeks to devalue your purchasing power by 2% <laughs> every year. Every year, this is happening, right? What's the, what's the cost of the expensive iPhone now? In the thousands, right? Flashback five years, it was probably $800, I don't know, maybe 900, right? It was big news for an iPhone to cost $1,000. That had not happened before. Right, every year. Okay, so here's purchasing power of $100 two years from now. It's, an, it's a what type of function? Exponential, great. So we talked about linear, now we're on to exponential. All right, what's the base of the exponential function? 0.98, does that mean it's growth or decay? Decay, great. It's decay if it's less than one, awesome. Your faculty are doing phenomenal jobs. <laughs> this is great, All right. So inflation decreases your purchasing power exponentially, right? So that is another insight from the math. So I've graphed for you from Wolfram Alpha, which is a great site. If you don't use it, I recommend it. Uh, the graph of this exponential function, right? And certainly it's decaying. After five years, 10% of your purchasing power has been lost. After 10 years, almost 20%. Anybody want to guess after 30? Or after 20, sorry? Yeah, pretty close, so 33%. Okay. So this is kind of a general fact of life, right? In the Great Depression and other deflationary environments, it changes, but there is an entity, the Fed, who actively seeks to do this. So the question is, how do you fight inflation, right? If there's a big powerhouse, you know, trying to devalue your dollar, how can you fight back, right? Fight the power type thing, right? So first insight as well, anything that's prone to inflation is inflated. So, um, the cost of college tuition is prone to inflation. I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old. I don't want to think about when they're 18. I can't afford their tuition now. I don't know if I'll be able to afford it then with inflation, right? So one thing you can do is you can try to convert your variable expenses into fixed expenses. This is fundamentally what getting a mortgage does, a fixed rate mortgage, right? So if you buy a house and you say, I want a loan for 30 years, and you're going to charge me 5%, your monthly payments stay the same, even though every year the Federal Reserve is devaluing your purchasing power. So that's a really nice way. And you might talk to some of your senior faculty and might ask them, you know, if they're comfortable, what's the current mortgage on your house, <laughs> right? And they might say, well, it's probably, you know, under a thousand or something. And if you go out into the market these days, it's depending on the house price, but still, you know, it's certainly much more expensive than it was 
when they bought their house because of the effect of converting a variable expense to a fixed expense. So next insight is by controlling the expenses, you can actually increase your savings because you're not spending money right, chasing the higher prices of inflation. And you can put that into financial independence. So there's actually a formula for that too, but I won't spoil the fun, right? This is in chapter four. I'm happy to, <laughs> happy to talk about it if questions come up. It involves a natural logarithm, actually a ratio of two natural logs. So again, you see all these pre-calculus functions cropping up in our daily lives. All right, so the moment you've all been waiting for, right? I will tell you, uh, give you a strategy for dating that is mathematically proven to uh, be semi-successful. Um, all right, so here's the setup. Have any of you seen The Millionaire Matchmaker? Okay, so this is roughly the same kind of setup. So suppose you have a really, really nice friend, right? And your friend has uh, taken the time to find you a personal matchmaker. So this person's name is Mary the Matchmaker. And your friend sets you up with Mary, and Mary says, you know what, there are N candidates that I have found just for you, right? Submitted all sort of information about what you're looking for and what you want, what you don't want. Mary has found you N candidates. And she says, I'm gonna let you meet them, but there are a few rules, right? First thing is you can meet with them, you can chat with them for five minutes, um, but you have to decide which one to ask out for a date. Okay, so Mary assures you that you can rank candidates with no ties from the dashboard. She gave you all of their information. Okay. So here are, some th uh, here are the three rules that Mary gives you for the events. If you reject someone, they're out for good, right? You can't go back later and say, I'm sorry I rejected you, but now I want to date you. Right? It's probably not going to work out so well. Number two, if you choose a date, right, Mary will just get rid of everybody else who was standing in line to meet you. So you will never know who you didn't meet because you chose someone. All right? And then the third rule, you must pick someone. Right? So poor Mary has put in a lot of work. Uh, and this is not free, or it took a lot of time, so she set you up with these end people, you gotta pick one. So the question, what's a good strategy? I would solicit uh, <laughs> strategies from the audience, but um, let me give you one. <laughs> so this is called uh, the X strategy, right? So why do I call it the X strategy? So here's the strategy, so you reject X of the end people you interview. Just reject them right away. Okay, but you gotta interview them. So this sounds a little mean, because what you're doing is you're having a five minute conversation with somebody, knowing that you're just gonna reject them anyway. Regardless of what they say, right? So that's, that's kind of mean. But we'll see why in a minute, you know, this kind of makes sense. All right, so after you've rejected those X of the N people, you pick the first one that is better than your leading contender. So while you're interviewing them, you're trying to form like an idea of who's the best of the bunch, and you keep that person in mind. And then after the X, you know, X plus one, you start seeing who's better than the best. And you pick that person once you find that person. It may happen that you, it takes you up until the last person and because of Mary's third rule, you have to pick someone and you pick the last person. So again, because of her third rule, someone always gets chosen, but at least you have a strategy. So what I'm showing here is actually a little bit of a probabilistic argument. So in the first uh, table up here, I'm assuming that x is zero. So I'm assuming that you pick the first person you meet, right, automatically. And so what have I done? I've, I've categorized the people that you would meet. I'm supposing there are only three candidates, <coughs> n equals three, and that you've categorized them into average, best, and better. All right, so again, Mary said you could have ranked them if I would have given you their files. So you can see in this first scenario, right, perhaps the first person that you see is average but I, it's, in, it's in bold because you just picked that person, right? So everything in parentheses are people you never saw because Mary got rid of them because you chose a date. In the second scenario, perhaps average shows up again. You know, again, you don't know that they're this person. The third scenario, perhaps better shows up and you pick that person. So the question is to you all, what is the probability of selecting the best candidate in this strategy? Yeah, how many choices do you have? How many scenarios are there? There are six, and you select the best in two of them, right, the, la the last two. So the probability of selecting the best candidate using this particular strategy is one-third, 
How about for scenario B, where you select the second person you meet, you automatically reject the first? What's the probability there of uh, selecting best? Yeah, it's higher, right? So here's best, here's best, here's best. That's three out of six. So that's a little higher. And then this is the scenario where you reject the first two and you select the last one. What's the probability there? Also one third, right? Two out of six. So what's the conclusion for this? Yeah, so the, all of the x's tell you how many you reject. If x equals 0, you just pick the, per the first person you meet. If x is 1, you reject the first person you meet. If x is 2, you reject the first two you meet. Right? So you can see that the strategy that works for three people that works best is strategy number two, where you reject the first person you meet, and then you go back and pick the person that was better. To illustrate the point, right? Here you are meeting average, you're, you're rejecting average, and then you meet better, and better is better than average. All right, so you pick that one, okay? But here you are rejecting better, you meet average, is that person better? Oh, so you wait. You end up meeting best, you pick that one. Okay, so that's how this strategy works. But again, you can see that the x equals one gives you the highest probability than the x equals zero or the x equals 2. So you might ask, how does this scale? Right? If Mary only gives you three potential candidates, that's not a big sample size. What if she gives you 13? What if she gives you 15? So what I've done for you is I've given you the optimal, using the same exact table method, the optimal x for each one of these ends. Can anyone make an observation about these last two columns? What do you notice? I'll start it for you. As n increases, the probability of getting your best candidate decreases, right? So that's a totally fair observation, right? And then you look at x over n. So again, this is the optimal number of people to reject flat out before you go back and start picking the best of the newest. And look at the ratio, right? What, what's the observation there? That's also kind of decreasing, but it seems to be what? Seems to be settling down, right? It kind of oscillates. And curiously, both numbers are settling down in the, in the 30s, right? So again, as a mathematician, when you see this, you think there's got to be something going on here, right? This can't just be chance, even though, again, it's dating and relationships, which sort of feels like chance, right? So indeed, you can prove mathematically that as n tends to infinity, again, this is a big number, but it's math, right? Uh, the optimal strategy is to reject the first 37% of candidates and then choose the one that's better that, than your leading contender, right? So this strategy selects the best candidate at least 37% of the time. So I'll say two things about this. First of all, you might be like, that's really low. This is a horrible strategy, 37%? That's like so low. And my answer would be like, we have assumed like nothing. I haven't asked you if you like, you know, long walks on the beach, <laughs> right? I haven't asked you if whatever your preferences are, like it's, this is just math. Uh, and then the second thing I would say is certainly that this is only one possible strategy. So you might think of a very interesting question. If I look at the set of all possible strategies, Right. Which one of those is optimal? So that's a different question right, from this, which is I gave you a strategy, and I asked how do we make it optimal? So again, this is mathematical thinking in the real world. So anyway, there's other things that we could have talked about, but I want to get back to the, to the um, end where I give you a chance to ask questions. Um, you can also use math to come up with equations for optimal decision making. If you're trying to subdivide like $100 or trying to decide where to move between you and your partner. If you want to live in LA, they want to live in New York, right? That's a continuous distance and you can decide to live somewhere in the middle, right? There's a way to do this optimally based on John Nash's bargaining problem. So there's a nice little algorithm for this. By the way, John Nash was profiled in the movie A Beautiful Mind, which is a great movie. Um, there's also an algorithm for forming couples whose members will never cheat. This is 
also crazy because it's real life, but it's not its math. And there's an algorithm. This is called the Gale Shapley algorithm. And actually, this is used to place medical school residents with their medical schools. It's still in use today. And college admissions used to use this to place students across different colleges. Okay, and then another algorithm for predicting divorce years before it happens. Again, using math. So, very cool. So you see the, you see the trend, right? So math can be understandable. It can be applicable. It can be personally relevant. It can be empowering. It can be all these things, right? So I hope that this talk has illustrated these characteristics of mathematics. Um, those are the books that you will find more information about this on. You can certainly look me up. Um, they focus on the ideas behind math, kind of like what I've just done, uh, and give you a sense of what uh, the equations you know, the formulas you understand, how they show up in your life. So I mentioned earlier that you'd be able to download this talk, right? So there it is. There's the link down there. So if you go there, you can download the talk, and then you can email me and say, can you clarify it? Slide number four, right? And I'd be happy to respond. All right, thank you. Questions for Oscar? We have a fair lot of time for questions. Yes. <laughs> the question was can I enlighten you on the non cheating algorithm? Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting algorithm, so I'll describe it quickly. So what you do is you do the following. You get a really long rope, and you lay it down on the floor. And I'll just use binary for now. You put all the men on one side. You put all the women on the other. And then you, just, you have a few rules. So you tell, first of all, beforehand, you, you give all the women all of the information on all the men. You give all the men all of the information on all the women. And everybody ranks everybody. So you show up with a list. Uh, Pedro is my top favorite, right? Or Luis is my top favorite, right? It's a ranked list. And then the matchmaking starts. So the matchmaker, let's suppose it's Mary, will say the following. And again, you can start with men or women choosing first, but we'll do the traditional uh, exposition of the algorithm. So the matchmaker will say, okay, men, cross the rope, pick your top ranked woman, right? So you'll probably get a horde of people who go to one particular woman and then, you know, all sorts of dynamics, right? And then what happens, right? So the matchmaker says, OK, um, those of you who are matched up, consider yourself engaged. Those of you who are not matched up, you know, men go back. And then the matchmaker says to the women, look at the man that proposed to you. If that man is high on your list, um, keep them. If that man is lower on your list, someone else who proposed to you, then you can trade up. OK, so there's a chance for the women who got multiple proposals to say, I'm going to pick from my top list of all of the proposals that I got. And you can show mathematically that if you keep this going, right, round after round after round, this will result in what are called stable couples, meaning that every couple, the man and the woman, here's the sort of unfortunate part, while they might not necessarily be each other's top choice, when you compare couples, no man is in a relationship where they could cheat across couples because every couple has kind of the best choice that they could have had, right? So the woman is as satisfied as the man relative to every other couple in any of these couples. So that's the stable matching algorithm, right? So no cheating is guaranteed. Again, total happiness across the board is harder to achieve, but <laughs> no cheating is a pretty good milestone, right, for math. Right. <laughs> Are there uh, other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good question. So the question was, do I use any of these tactics in my daily life? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> the longer answer is actually, I think all of us use some of these tactics, right? So think about the X strategy, right? You certainly don't want to meet the first person you marry. I mean, maybe some people do. Oh, sorry, marry, marry the first person you meet. Maybe some people do, right? But usually, your family, your friends will counsel, you know what, sense of what's out there to educate yourself on what, you know, who you want to be with, right? And just get an idea. 
right? So that's already kind of in the X strategy, right? You're, you're kind of going on dates to get a sense of how the population is in terms of your likes and dislikes. And then at some point, you decide to start choosing someone, perhaps, to settle down with. Which, again, sounds very much like the X strategy. And at that point, when you do that, you think back to all the boyfriends and girlfriends and everything you've had. And you're like, well, you know, what I really thought was useful was that they, whatever, spoke Spanish. I don't know. Right? So you're, you're thinking of choosing a person who is at least as good as probably the best that you have dated. So it's, it's, I would argue the X strategy is actually a pretty close approximation to what we already do, many of us in our life. Second question. <laughs> yeah, so again, this is something that I don't use personally. Um, but as I said, the, the medical residency programs, right, and some of the college admissions, and you'll find it everywhere, right? This is actually in places that are in use still. The technical term for this going back in the literature is called the secretary problem. This originated in the 50s when uh, uh, companies had a very similar problem. You can imagine they get 100 applications for being a secretary, and they have to choose someone. But they know that if they bring somebody in for an interview and they reject them, the chances of calling them back and saying, no, 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 we changed our mind, come back, work for us, are very slim. Because that person might have moved on and accepted another job offer. So actually, this is kind of how this you know, algorithm started. People thinking, well, when do I stop? Right after I've met 20 of the secretaries? After I've met 30, 40? When can I know? And is there a number I can say, if I stop here, I am guaranteed to be at least this successful? So that's really where it came from. So if you Google search secretary problem, you'll find a bunch of literature on this applied to different contexts. This is a phenomenal question. <laughs> and as I tell my students now that I have tenure, I don't know the answer. <laughs> but this is a great question, right? This is one thing that I actually do write in the book, somewhat related to this. One of the things I didn't talk about was this cool dynamics of like stable couples and unstable couples. But where I'm getting to is what I write in the book is that some questions come up related to these topics, and they're very mathematical in nature. This is a perfect example. Right? So if you're interested in these sorts of things, I would go to your faculty member and say, hey, I want to work on this, right? Can you find some references for me? This is a lot of time how math research Somebody has a good question which people don't know the answer to. So you go off and you try to make sense of it and maybe make some headway and you communicate that new knowledge. Right? So I totally encourage you. And once you figure it out, let me know, right? <laughs> I'd love to know the answer. It's a good question. Yeah? I made you focus on these <clears throat> so the question is, what made me focus on these three topics? So I really wanted to write about something that touches all of our lives. And I felt like health, personal finance, and um, relationships is something that most of us think about all the time. But most of us think about it in a very non-mathematical way. Right? Your mom tells you, eat your fruits and veggies. Right? That's the extent. Or you know, somebody in your family says, you know what, buy a house, because that's going to be your ticket to retirement. So math is always in the background. And certainly numbers, you know, you look at food label, there's calories, there are numbers there, right? You look at your paycheck, there are numbers there. So once you start peering into the numbers, right, you'll find some deeper concepts. You find multilinear functions, you find exponential decay, you find ratios of logarithms, you find probability. And that's really for me what applied math is about. You peer deeper and deeper, and these general patterns start to, um, to come up. Yep. So for like the love and relationships uh, formulas and how you guys like 37%, yeah. so I know in like game theory, so mm -hmm. you set up these situations where you put all these restrictions on all these people and you assume all these things, but obviously actual people are a lot more nuanced. Have you seen <coughs> these kind of situations done in practical study other than like the Michigan of uh, medical residency? The question was, have I seen these um, sorts of uh, formalized derivations of the 30% rule done in, in, um, in real world settings other than the medical studies. I haven't, I haven't done a deep literature search to see if there are other settings. Um, 
What I do want to sort of piggyback on that question, which is a very interesting question, the, the genesis of it. Um, if a theorem is true using certain hypotheses, for example, if I have a right triangle, what's true about its sides? The Pythagorean theorem, right? What if I have something that's not quite a right triangle, almost a right triangle? Is it still true that c squared equals a squared plus b squared? Not really, but does anybody know about something else that's kind of almost like Pythagorean theorem? Law of cosines, right? So there's this interesting notion that a lot of times we do mathematical modeling and we simplify the real world to make it more tractable and to study it. And maybe we come up with a result like the 37% rule is a very interesting question, which is to say, if I change the assumptions a little bit, how does that affect the conclusion? Right? And again, you can kind of see in the Pythagorean theorem. Um, so yeah, so I would dive into the literature search to see other examples. But to me, the more interesting question is, in the real world, as you mentioned, right, these assumptions are not strictly going to be satisfied. How confident are you then in the conclusion? How much does it change? Is it just totally not valid? So I'll leave that to you to think about. Thank you. Questions? Yep. Uh, what made you decide to write a popular math book? Yeah, so the question was, what made me decide to write a popular math book? Um, <clears throat> you all probably ask this of your professors, right? You say, when are we ever going to use this, right? Especially when you're learning about 2x plus 3 and you know, simplify x squared minus 9 over x minus 3, or like take the limit. They're like, this is dry, this is boring, right? And I got the same exact um, questions from some of my students. So I decided that, you know what, I view it very differently through my lens because of my training. But my students don't have that training, and hopefully they'll get to that point at some point. But I want to somehow give them my, the lens that I have, you know. So when I see lights, I think electromagnetic wave, I think Faraday and Maxwell, and equations come up, and it's very cool. Right? But that's not what most people think about. When Dude, it's light. You know? <laughs> right? So I wanted to write about how you could view the world a little differently through a different lens, but make it accessible so that you would use the math that you've learned right? to give you that connection of, hey, you learned about 4.5x plus 884. You did a problem like that somewhere in your class. But now you know that, hey, it's kind of related to your body's resting metabolic rate. Right, so I really wanted to tie things to a personal level. Yeah, we go back there. From writing this book and also just having lectured it over time with these examples, mm -hmm. has it changed the way you approach teaching about math? <laughs> and also, it, if there's something you could change about how mathematics gets taught, what would you, what would you do to it? Oh boy, how much time do we have? <laughs> 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 Definitely. I mean, so. <clears throat> I'll say that my approach to teaching math is that every one of you can be a mathematician. So I really believe that, right? The question is, how can I, as your professor, best help you accomplish your goals? Which is slightly different, right? Your goal might not be to be a mathematician. You might want to be an engineer. You might want to be an artist. You might want to be an English professor, right? But fundamentally, right, math gets a bad rap because it's abstract. It's inapplicable to the real life. It's you know, a bunch of formulaic, algorithmic type plug and chug type things. This is another reason why I wanted to write these books, right? to use the stuff that you think about hopefully every day and to bring it back to the math you're studying to show you that, hey, maybe you thought you weren't interested in math, but maybe that was because the way it was presented to you was very abstract, inapplicable, algorithmic. If instead you knew about, hey, every time you're going to eat an apple, think about how many calories that is, think about your TDEE, think about your RMR. Or every time you're going to get your paycheck and you see the numbers changing, maybe think about inflation. Right? Maybe my hope was that if I instead connected it to your real world experience, you would start to view math not really as this abstract and applicable thing, but really as actually it's all around you. Right? Look at the angles in this room. Look at the triangles. Right? I mean, it's really everywhere when you start trying to, to look for it. So I was trying to enable that process through the writing. But definitely a focus, I think, on applicable, relevant, personally relevant, societally relevant mathematics helps, and research shows this, helps your learning. So I would definitely say that's something I try to do as a result of these, writing these books. Yeah? What's the highest level of mathematics 
So the, the, this one, the calculus of happiness, is just pre-calculus. So I really wanted to keep that as a level to make it very accessible. The first one, everyday calculus, um, if you don't know any calculus, that's fine. If you do know some calculus, you'll be taught other things you might not have thought about. Right? So both books, I try to set calculus as the ultimate ceiling, really first semester calculus. But again, this one that I was telling you about, pre-calculus, is all that you will need. Um, yeah. Boy, there are so many. So here's a you know an example that comes to mind. Um, many of you probably have credit cards, right? So you have a balance on your credit card that's five hundred dollars. Sure. Uh, the interest rate is ten percent, and there's a minimum payment. So if you look in your credit card statement these days, I think by federal law now, it's a requirement that they tell you how many years it will take you to pay off your credit card if you make only the minimum payments. So you might think, how do they calculate that? Is this like a you know, guess and check, right? But it's a math problem. If I have $500 and I pay $35, right? And then whatever balance I have, I add like 10% because of interest. And I pay another $35. And whatever balance I have, I add 10%. So what you get is actually called a series. So you might learn about this in calculus too. So you can solve this problem by finding effectively the sum of an infinite series. Right? It's not infinite in the sense of it'll take you forever to pay it, but you can morph this problem into what's called an infinite series. And the question is, like, what is the sum of this series? You know, if I make $35, $35, $35, right, when does it end? So it turns out to be a finite series if you do it this way, but you get a formula for what's called a present value of a future annuity or something like that. I forget the technical term. Um, so you can use this to actually calculate this number for yourself, right? You don't have to take the credit card's uh, word for it, right? The company's word for it. You can calculate it. If I pay off this many dollars a month, how long would it take me to pay off? Assuming, again, every, every month I get some amount of compounding. Um, so I'll think of a cooler example than that, but that's one that came to mind. Since it's Cal 2, so it's right after the calculus one that uh, pops up. Over here, yeah. That was a really great presentation. Thank I was you. trying to develop a mathematical formula for the Now, a baby either puts a happiness or is it unhappy for pleasure, it's a pleasurable day or it's a painful day. Mm -hmm. I was thinking there's three, three criteria. One, they came up with the duration, put that D in formula, duration of five minutes. The other one would be the intensity. Mm -hmm. so I say from zero to 100, what was the intensity of the <coughs> <coughs> last one is certainty for probability. But in certainty, you have the knowledge of certainty very much in the mm -hmm. Now you have perception of certainty, how you see this thing. And then you have the truth of certainty, which is more powerful. Mm -hmm. And then with the subscript, well, with that frequency that they like. It. <laughs> What I like about this, right, this is mathematical modeling in action, right? So you're trying to think a problem. You, you, you have a problem. You're trying to quantify what are the variables. And you're trying to use your day-to-day -day experience to try to come up with some tools or, or lenses through which you can input these as variables in your equation. I'll say one thing. This is very similar, actually, to one thing I do discuss in the book, a dynamical systems approach to dating, right? So imagine two people, right? They don't see each other. The moment they see each other, what happens? But if you're thinking like a mathematician, I would say there are some signals that have been sent. Right? Literally, you have seen the person, the person has seen you. So there's some evaluation if you're in the dating framework. right? There's some evaluation that's going on, physical attractiveness, maybe some judgments about socioeconomic status. All sorts of things are happening. right? So as you try to quantify this, you can think of it as a dynamical system. If I start with that as the initial condition, what happens to the feelings of each person over time? You can imagine if I like fix my hair, does that, am I sending the wrong message? Right? How does that message get received by the other person? If the other person moves closer to me, right, how does that make me feel? So you can imagine any relationship really as a dynamical system where there's like feelings dynamics that change over time. And anytime you have something that's changing, you should think of calculus. Calculus is the mathematics of change. Technically infinitesimal change, but 
I'll take just change. <laughs> Sure. Um, in your table of protein, carbohydrates, and fat, mm -hmm. and you know, you know carbos and cereals and carbohydrates and cheese and rice. Mm -hmm. uh, so, where do apples as such fit in? Are they carbos, or do you just say it's fruit or vegetable? We don't count that as calories. Right. So, these are the, the great debate of macronutrients, right? So, apples are mostly sugar, simple sugars, so that counts in the carbohydrate category. But then even in the carbohydrate category, there's really like complex carbohydrates like a bread. There's simple carbohydrates like an apple. There's fibrous carbohydrates like broccoli. There's non-fibrous. So in each of these macronutrients kind of split into their own, not quite micronutrients, because that's like vitamins, but they split into like smaller categories of macronutrients, if that makes sense. Exactly, yeah. So when you look at the molecular structure, yep. Yeah. Fructose is different from sucrose. Yeah, yeah. So not only is a calorie not a calorie, right, but also, again, the, the chemical structure has bearing on how your body processes it. Yeah. There's a oh, for sure, yeah. One of the things I do in there, actually, which you might be interested in, I call it the um, rational food choice function. So you can ask the following question. If you have 100 calories to spend, what should you eat? Okay. Interesting question. You could certainly eat like this much of a croissant, or it turns out you can eat like 300 strawberries. Both of those things are 100 calories. So this brings up the notion of energy density, right? If I eat 300 strawberries, I'm going to feel pretty, pretty full. If I eat like this little bit of a croissant, I'm not going to feel full. So the notion of energy density is that the croissants are way more energy dense. For each gram, you get way more energy out of it, right? There's a lot of fat. There's a lot of stuff in there. The strawberries, comparatively speaking, are way less energy dense. It turns out if you graph right, this, uh, this notion, you get this nice little 100 over G function. So you tell me how much the food weighs. I divide 100 by that, 100 calories, and I get an energy density, calories per gram. So croissants would be like way up here, like four calories per gram density. Strawberries would be like way down here, like, I don't know, 0.25. It turns out when you look at this graph, this is in the book and in other places, all of the fruits and vegetables are over here. In other words, they're very low energy density. You can imagine eating like a whole stick of broccoli, right, and it's like five calories. Right? If you eat like a whole, a whole thing of pizza, it's like 5,000 calories. Right? So again, even, even that, when you, when you look at it mathematically, like, you gain insight. Right? You're like, fruits and vegetables are very energy dense. You will feel fuller faster. And it turns out all the micronutrients, that's where they are. Right? What does pizza have? It has protein, has a lot of greasy fats, and then it has carbs from the bread. Right? What about the fruits and vegetables? Like all the vitamins, the B complex, the you know, the folate, everything is in there that's not in the pizza. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was wondering, like, this book is focusing on nutrition, relationships, and finance. Mm -hmm. So if there was a sweet sequel to this book, what would it focus on? What are the? <laughs> <laughs> what, um, yeah. What topics would it focus? So the question is, if there was a sequel to the book, what would it focus on? The answer is there actually is a sequel, but it's not to this book. Um, so I've just finished writing a third book. So this one's called Calculus Simplified. Um, this is a different way to restructure the calculus first semester experience, which is somewhere between like calculus for dummies and a calculus textbook. Right? So if you picture this, it's a book which has theorems. It has proofs, but it's not a textbook. But it's a book which tries to actually talk to you about calculus versus like, let f be a function. Consider the domain of f of, you know, that very formal language you would see in a textbook. Um, so it's a little unrelated to this, but it's, again, based on the same idea of connecting what you already know about math in a way that makes it accessible, that makes it relevant versus abstract and applicable. But in terms of the fun book, right, the next one I want to write is Everyday Linear Algebra. So linear algebra is, if you talk to any mathematician, like the one thing that they'll say, it's everywhere, right? They'll say math is everywhere, but they'll say linear algebra is everywhere. 
And there's so many cool things about linear algebra, so I'm very excited about that. So that'll come in like 2025, I don't know. <laughs> Stay tuned. I'm going to ask John's question because it's the last one. I wanted to know what the, uh, the distribution of the average better best was. The distribution of the average best. Were you trying to make an equal distribution of every stage? No. At some point, of course, happened later. Right? Yeah, that's another question that I don't have the answer to. These are great questions. <laughs> yeah. But I will stay here, right? So please, if you haven't spoken up, this is one thing I tell students in my class, you know. I know there's someone else out there that has a question that hasn't spoken up. All right, so I'll stay right here so you can come up and talk to me.